Well, that's it, is it? The humans finally got them. The Galactic Council tried to keep the humans from getting them in many different ways. Putting out a ban on genetic editing on any non-consenting sentient life forms. Dying them, it would be a boring and time-consuming, monotonous task. We told them we ourselves have had tried something similar several times. But the cost and dull nature of the research was just too much. We lied, made false reports about how one scientist, who never really existed, killed himself from banging his head on his desk one too many times out of sheer boredom. We put laws in place preventing sentience from subjugating and taking in non-sentient races or uplifting them. There were, of course, clauses to grandfather in pets that were already, quote, domesticated. It's fine to keep domesticating pet animals that were domesticated before the law, but to do so to new ones is strictly prohibited. We told the humans it was due to some reptilian race domesticating a mammalian super predator. But it wasn't. No. It was to prevent the humans from making their own super predator. One that, when the rest of the galaxy heard about, collectively had a panic attack. Now... This may be an overreaction, as some races actually do have old super predators as domesticated pets. In fact, almost like domestication and becoming an intelligent dominant race goes hand in hand, like the Quilan and their insect meek pets. Small, spider-like things with scythes, kind of like an earth mantis at the front, and since as well beyond the Quilan themselves, just as an example. These meek have a full range of vision and range in size from small enough to carry on a shoulder to large enough to ride into war. These are terrifying, yes, but compared to the things that humans wanted to create, they were puny, stupid, and weak little things to be crushed like the bugs they are. The humans already had their own super predators too, of course, like their so-called, quote, humanity's best friend, or Dogs who come in so many sizes and breeds, I'd be stupid to list them all here. They're quadrupedal beasts who can outrun any human, have a sense of smell used for tracking that bordered on uncanny, and then combined with the human's tracking skills, they never fail to find their prey. The dog's sense of hearing, or even their crushing bite force, etc. Still, compared to what the humans wanted to make, these dogs seem docile and tame, like cute little cuddly toys. But, despite our best efforts, the humans managed to get not one, not two, but 27 different breeding programs from crossbreeding and in vitro fertilization. Methods, which as defined by galactic law, are not technically genetic engineering. Now, humans have their long sought after, long extinct pet. Yeah, extinct. The Galactic Council had absolutely buried the records, and I mean buried them. But we visited Earth before, mm, towards the middle of their medieval era, when we saw the humans' tendency to tame dangerous creatures, and a creature so dangerous that one of the scouts went into a fear-induced coma. They decided one of them had to go. One of these beasts attacked the research ship, and the pilot waved it off. I mean, they were in a state-of-the-art armored galactic scout ship that could deflect micrometeoroids in the void like they were nothing and take the heat of re-entering any planet's atmosphere with ease. But this creature's teeth punctured the ship's armor like it was paper. Its claws shredded the plate armor as if it were made of soft-woven threads. Then there was the breath. These things, due to some quirk in their biology, would store methane inside of a specialized lung-like organ. This methane was used to boost their metabolic rates when needed, giving insane healing rates. But the other use for it is the reason we almost lost that scout ship. This creature, this flying, scaled monster would in its infancy break its own eggshell, which had a high concentration of flint in it, 
This flint would coat the back molars of this beast's teeth. Then, as they grew and stored methane in their bodies, they would gain the ability to release all of it through their mouth. As they opened their jaws, their teeth would strike the flint, causing a spark. In essence, they could, for burst of up to 30 human seconds, breathe fire with a cooldown of a week or so while the methane built back up in their system. The scout ship's heat shield was overwhelmed and completely collapsed after a mere five seconds, and the scoring on the ship when it puttered back into the docks was almost like a form of art. The council, of course, immediately sent out military fleets and exterminated the species. Now, genocide like that is rare and highly frowned upon, but those monsters, those dragons, needed to go. Now, there were two different varieties. The first variety is the eastern dragon, which were long noodle-like things that had anti-gravity organs. Yeah, organs. These things had anti-gravity biologically. Their scales were immune to every single type of damage we tried to throw at them until we literally just started throwing things at them using ballistics. They could also breathe fire, but they could adjust the cone intensity and thus the temperature of it. Our ships going down in plumes of white hot flames was not entirely uncommon, sadly. We weren't even sure we got all the eastern ones either. They were smart, crafty things, but not sentient, but definitely intelligent. Now, once enough of their numbers were cold, they hid, and after searching for 10 years and not finding any, we collected our scrap and left for the west. Now, the western dragons were hardier things, bulky as hell, and we needed some serious high-caliber rounds and armor-piercing ammunition in order to even hurt them. Killing them took the equivalent of an orbital bombardment straight to their face. Now, they couldn't control the heat of their fire, but the burst of it made it so it didn't even matter a little. The sheer volume of fire made up for it, and their claws, well, we still don't even have an alloy to properly compare it to. Now, the humans have recreated these old monsters that they thought were legends. As a side note, the humans are the most terrifying predators the galaxy has ever fracking seen. They would go out with nothing but metal armors and swords, pikes, spears, and they would fight these things, often even successfully slaying them. We tried. We, we really tried to stop the humans from getting dragons again. But it won't be 10 Earth years before we end up seeing these beasts on human battlefields or following loyal behind a human through a space station or, if they're the eastern variety, hanging around the human's neck willingly like a scarf. Even worse, the dragons the humans have bred can actually speak and, by, and are, by all measure, sentient. They choose to be a human's pet and followers. Choose it! This also means they can consent to genetic augmentation and tampering, too. At least the old dragons were somewhat intelligent, but, like, none of them could speak. Global super predators, sure, but still just mere beasts. Honestly speaking, the humans should thank us a little bit. Old dragons love to eat humans, especially for some odd reasons. They would attack towns, villages. Hell, even a few cities fell under the wrath of these creatures. A lot of humans tried to tame them for a long time long time, but nobody ever did anything but become a meal for the old dragons. After a while, the humans gave up and just started hunting the beast back. But now the dragons they have are not only intelligent, but sentient. These new dragons, due to their intelligence, are orders of magnitude more dangerous than their old separated ancestors. I wish that were all too, but it isn't. Dragon psychology is now a thing, and apparently, they have this mentality that humans are the superior race to them, not through might or birth, but by knowledge and understanding. The dragons now willingly stunt their own growth genetically to stay by the human side. The western dragons are no bigger than a Great Dane. Sorry, it's 
a larger breed of dog. Intentionally, so as to not be in their, quote, master's way. Yeah, master. Now, granted, the humans hate this term, but the dragon's pride apparently sees it as a must, and whatever human adopts them is, from that point forward, their master. They don't see themselves as slaves, as they will leave abusive masters or retaliate, but as servants and family members of these humans. Now, the eastern dragons prefer to normally be the size of a bow constrictor from Earth. Uh, it's a large reptilian predator with an uncanny resemblance to what the dragons were. Huh. Perhaps they're a branch in their evolution. Anyway, they love to hang around the necks and shoulders of their human masters and share their body heat. Now, they aren't cold-blooded, they just like the warmth, kind of like a human cat. On that note, the eastern dragons can be just as fickle as a Borska cat. They can... T- they can at least accept a wrong, though. The Western dragons will double, triple, quadruple down like a stubborn bull. But I think that phrase will soon be replaced with stubborn like a Western dragon. At this point, there's an honest to science debate in the council right now over whether or not to tell the humans about the past. The two, op- the two opinions boil down to this. If we don't tell the humans and they find out about it, they will go on a war of unholy vengeance. And the other side says, well, if we tell the humans, they will get angry and go on a war of unholy vengeance. But, well, if you're watching this, you know I've said, crack it. And told the humans. This is, after all, a galactic-wide live stream. Now, I've been ignoring chat, but let's see. Oh, oh my, there are a lot of humans here. Okay, okay, yeah, good, good, some mixed reactions, but, you know, uh, mostly thankful for telling them, it would seem. (laughs) Well, let's hope this gamble pays off, then. Record by History Vod, the High Counselor Nagar of the Zenin race for the, quote, message that brought peace to the galaxy.